Once again, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. This is Don Basler, Raid Mobile Safety. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Chief Lawrence Zacharisi, the Assistant Chief of Police and Director of the Office of Emergency Management at Stony Brook University. Chief Zacharisi has a Doctor of Law from Truro College Jacob D. Fuchsberg Law Center. He has a Master's of Public Administration and a BA in Forensic Psychology from City University of New York, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Chief Zacharisi started his uh, career as a volunteer firefighter and an emergency medical, direct, emer emergency medical technician um, and eventually began work uh, in the New York City Police Department where he rose to the ranks from a patrol officer to plainclothes anti-crime officer to the Emergency Service Unit of the Special, Opera Special Operations Division and ultimately worked as a uniformed patrol supervisor in the Street Narcotics Enforcement Unit. Um, Chief Zacharisi has been in his position at Stony Brook since 2009. He has overseen every aspect of university and hospital security during that time and currently is the Director of Emergency Operations Center in the Office of Access Control and Physical Security Office of Emergency Management. If you want to learn more about uh, Chief Zacharisi, you can go to LinkedIn because I, I just touched the surface of his experience and his, the breadth of, of, of what he can do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chief Zacharisi. Thank you, Don. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thanks to, uh, to Rave for, uh, for inviting me and having me here today. They're a great partner. Always love to work with them and uh, happy to share our experiences. Um, as we all know in this business, uh, never waste a good emergency, and, and we certainly didn't waste one during uh, Superstorm Sandy. But uh, first, a little bit about, uh, about Stony Brook and about the university, uh, and just to touch on what Don said, I'm happy to take questions uh, along the way afterwards, and, and certainly by, by email thereafter if, uh, if needed. So, so those of you that don't know Stony Brook, it's uh, one of uh, 64 campuses in the State University of New York system, uh, been around uh, just about 60 years. Uh, our campus is considered one of the flagship campuses, if you will, uh, one of five university centers. Uh, just an equal complement of about uh, students and uh, faculty and staff, all told. We have uh, just around 50 to 60,000 people on our campus every day, uh, really more of a small city in some respects. Uh, the important thing to note is really the last bullet there, that the, uh, the university itself is um, really a crucial and ir irreplaceable part of the, the Long Island, uh, Nassau and Suffolk County regions, both we're in Suffolk County and our uh, adjoining county is Nassau County, all told about 3 million people uh, and the university accounts for about 4% of all of the economic activity in the region, which is uh, as substantial and will be relevant when we talk about the storm. So the campus itself, uh, we house about 11,000. That's a little bit up. We actually have a new uh, construction project. So just about 12,000 of our 24,000 students live on campus. And it's a complement of undergraduate and graduate uh, students. We have uh, a, a, both apartment style and traditional dorm style. And again, we just have a new 750 bed uh, residence hall that opened up six months ago. The important thing to note here are really the last two things. Uh, about 75% of our residential students live in this county the adjoining county or the one right after that in, in Queens County. Uh, and that became really important when we started to do our, uh, I'll call it our voluntary evacuation in anticipation of the storm. Uh, and not that we're a commuter campus by any means, but uh, they live lo local enough to do where uh, they, they certainly go home, the students on the weekends, uh, if for no other reason than to get laundry done. Uh, and the last point is, is important because 20% uh, of that population are students that, that can't go home. They're either international students or out-of-state students. So even if we were able to get rid of, um, you know, the, the vast majority for infrastructure issues, or in the case here, evacuation for an impending storm, we're going to be uh, to be responsible for just around 5,000 or so uh, students, no matter what. So a little bit about the hospital, we'll, we'll kind of focus on that. That's a, a latest picture of our, of our hospital. The, the older portion of the hospital is in the background the, and the newer ones in the front. So we are the, uh, 
the uh, level one trauma center for the only regional trauma center, um, although that's kind of changing with some of our partner hospitals. There are 11 hospitals in Suffolk County, uh, Stony Brook being the, the, the regional trauma center, um, the only tertiary care facility, and those bed numbers are up actually probably somewhere around 675 uh, almost 700. We have a dedicated PEDS emergency department uh, with the only burn center for the county and the only uh, dedicated comprehensive uh, psychiatric facility for the county. Uh, the county police department as well as multiple towns, villages, and other law enforcement agencies bring all of the, uh, the pre-hospital psychiatric patients to our facility, uh, both for emergency treatment as well as inpatient treatment. So some, some critical operations there that we really can, uh, can't go out of business on, if you will. Uh, it's just an overview of some of our other specialized services and, and really to highlight uh, both our you know, intricate relationships with, um, with the community, with uh, medical needs of the communities, uh, but as well as the, you know, the, the campus itself. Uh, we're sort of divided with a, a county roadway that goes in between us, but all told the, the campus proper is about 1,600 acres, um, not, not including our Southampton campus. And I think there's a slide coming up with a map that I can distinguish between those two. Uh, also unique uh, for, for the campus is our housing and our uh, responsibility for the Long Island State Veterans Home, which is a standalone skilled nursing facility, 350 beds over and above the, uh, the bed count and the licensing for the hospital, where we have some of the nation's uh, World War I, World War II veterans, uh, some of the, uh, the real rich history uh, and, and some, some patients that are in a specialized, certainly the tertiary care aspects or the skilled nursing aspects, I should say. And what's important to note here is the Veterans Home is a member of our regional uh, surge capacity plan as it relates to patients uh, in both nursing as well as uh, long-term care facilities. So and that became important during the storm itself. So it's important to note here, you know, it really is, and I know uh, talking to Don, there's several disciplines, uh, whether it's security, whether it's media relations, legal, uh, risk management, industrial hygiene, I know that some of the titles, uh, which, which is great to have a, a broad spectrum, but the, the really the takeaway here is um, it's the, the, the two pieces coming together, business uh, continuity and continuity of operations, continuity of government, however we describe it, there's a bunch of different uh, terms in the industry out there, but the, the practices and the things we put into place and the plans we have and the, our level of prepare, preparedness I like to call it our organizational resiliency, um, pays dividends on the back end. And those of us in the security area, or those of us in the areas where, uh, you know, there's not a big return on investment or that, that tangible return on investment until something happens. A lot of us work in the, uh, you know, in case of emergency break glass uh, scenario and there's a, a security is expensive, uh, IT and, and technology is expensive for communications and, and the like. Uh, but the, the real takeaway here is that the more you invest up front, uh, I can tell you that um, it will pay, pay dividends in return. So the, uh, the highest level, you know, looking at the 50,000 foot level at the hospital, um, what are the responsibilities? So first and foremost in the healthcare environment, obviously it's patients. Uh, we have to make sure that, you know, we can continue the, the continuity of care for those that we have. Uh, those patients that are there and then also in, in the case of uh, you know a large influx whether it's related to a public health emergency whether it's related to uh, a terrorist attack whether it's related to a regional weather event um, how much can the hospital take in how quickly can we per, you know convert um, non-clinical space to clinical space um, non-traditional areas to those areas how can we get staff in um, what procedures do we have in place? How quickly do we, you know, how quickly can we stand it up? How much notice do we need? How often do we practice those plans and procedures? It's nice, uh, you know, when I do this lecture, this this is sort of a scaled down version. I've done it as long as three hours uh, uh, out in Wisconsin at a state emergency management conference. And one of the slides is a picture of somebody reaching for a book on a shelf uh, with big books. And the analogy I give is your plans are only as good as uh, the content within them and how often you exercise them as well as people's familiarity with what's inside. In other words, if you blow off dust on the cover of your continuity of operations plan and your first page has people's pager or beeper numbers listed, you're doing something wrong. So uh, that's just you know something important to think about. Uh, as well as the facilities themselves, uh, you know how 
do we have redundant power? Uh, can we have you know redundant uh, infrastructure as it relates to our IT needs? And we'll talk about that in uh, our uh, our uh, case study that's coming up soon. Uh, and then I mentioned sort of resources, that's personnel resources as well as equipment resources. Uh, and then staff, how do we communicate? Do we have uh, essential personnel that are required to come to work? Uh, and if they are required to come to work, how do we make sure if they're gonna be there for any length of time that their family are taken care of? Do they have pets, do they have children, do they have elderly loved ones that they're responsible for? All these things that aren't necessarily thought of um, you know, un until, uh, until we have to think of them. Uh, so back in, uh, I came in 2009, and 2009, 2010, uh, I was uh, tasked with um, taking on the, uh, our uh, emergency notification system and our uh, mass communication uh, policy, both uh, our practices, both from a policy standpoint, as well as uh, finding a new provider. The one we, we had at the time, uh, we sort of exceeded the capacity, the technological capacity of the provider. Uh, and really needed to go beyond, uh, you know, simply just email. So we were looking for a multimodal solution, uh, voice, text, and email for sure. Uh, some debate back and forth about opting in, opting out. I can tell you, and this is not necessarily a popular uh, decision, but we we don't give uh, staff um, and employees an opportunity. Everybody is included. Uh, they, at a minimum, will get an email every single time because uh, the university owns your, the email address, um, and then we strongly encourage. Uh, people to opt in for you know for phone and for voice and text. If you're issued a university issued cell phone, you, you're again you're automatically opted in, and we strongly encourage our, our students uh, to to do that as well. And we have a a very high compliance rate uh, as as that happens to be. You know I, I like to have this in here because uh, our partners in FEMA um, sort of you know cinch up and and summarize what I'm saying, but. You know, continuity planning is simply the good business practice of ensuring the execution of essential functions and a fundamental duty of public and private entity responsible to their stakeholders. What does that mean? It means we all have to work together. We have to plan in advance, but everybody has to realize that continuity is not just for the IT folks. It's not just for the risk management folks. Every single person in the organization, whether it's a small community hospital or a large, you know, academic medical center like, like we have here at Stony Brook, uh, everybody is a stakeholder, and it's important to engage the community. Uh, and, and there's not really a lot of time uh, in this presentation, and I'll try to touch on it. But the role that we played regionally uh, during the storm uh, really was something that, that not even I, and it's my responsibility to think about these things, not even I could have predicted uh, the, the, the really important role that we would have played, a non-traditional role. So we'll transition now into uh, you know the, the Superstorm Sandy. We're going to go back to October of 2012. Um, you know, we'll talk about the the impact and the response itself, but really the recovery and the lessons learned uh, are invaluable and have propelled our emergency management program from where it was, uh, where I thought we were, were doing things right and thought we were doing a pretty good job, to uh, where we are today. When we're, we're in a much better position again, building that organizational resilience. So uh, we'll get into the the details and the timeline a little bit now. So just to give you an overlay, that's that's Long Island. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, uh, we are the primary campus is located right there in the geographic center, uh, where it says Stony Brook University and Stony Brook Medicine R and D Park. That's our main campus. We have research uh, affiliations and associations with Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, as well as the Brookhaven National Laboratory. As a matter of fact, a good portion of the uh, employees at Brookhaven are actually dual uh, appointed employees of Stony Brook. Our president sits on the uh, is the president is the advisor the CEO of Brookhaven Science Associates. So there's uh, this inextricable link between uh, research and and the role that Stony Brook plays. But again, that regional uh, impact you see out the Stony Brook Southampton that's out in the eastern end of Long Island. We wound up evacuating that entire campus. Uh, it's built in a uh, in a slosh zone, a, a hurricane inundation zone for Category One storm, uh, and at the time. We were expecting Category 2 plus inundations with storm surge and the like. And at the time, Stony Brook, Manhattan as well. Uh, again, in the interest of time and space in the uh, in the presentation, they're not in there, but we have pictures of parking garages and the uh, you know places in, in Lower Manhattan, the battery of Lower Manhattan, uh, that were under 14 and 15 feet of water, including uh, in proximity to our campus there. 
So just a picture of the enormity. This was uh, probably two or three days out uh, from when we were expecting landfall, and our preparations really began uh, 72 plus hours out uh, in preparation for this. So the day of, uh, I would say in advance of this, we had done, like as I mentioned, we, we had evacuated our Southampton campus. We had sent a campus-wide blast email to, to any students that saying, you know, if you live in an area where it's safe to go home, please go home. Uh, but certainly if you're not uh, able to do that, then, then stay here. Uh, we had a shelter in place uh, at, you know, one o'clock that afternoon, anticipation for the, uh, the, the, the landfall, which 17, uh, you know, 5.30 p.m., 6.30 p.m., uh, we did a mass feeding effort to get everyone out there to get food and supplies and get back to their rooms. Now, it's it's important to note that Stony Brook is, is really located. It's one of the tallest structures. The hospital is the tallest structure uh, in Suffolk County, 20-story uh, hospital. But we are um, – our elevation is very, very high. Uh, we're high above sea level. Uh, now, the north shore of Long Island is pretty close to us. The south shore and the barrier island of, of uh, Fire Island on the south shore between – um, the bay and and the Atlantic Ocean um, is very very far away. But the partners that we uh, included in our long term care plans and our surge capacity plans have facilities in those areas. So we'll we'll get into that. So things really began to uh, to go sideways, as we like to say in the business, about uh, 7 p.m. when all at the same time we lost all three of our internet service providers, uh, essentially our connection to the outside world. Uh, at the time, all three of them went through uh, Manhattan. Uh, and through that, that Battery Park area that I spoke about, which was essentially underwater. So we lost all three, and we lost them and did not have them for uh, more than more than 24 hours. But like good emergency managers, we, we plan, and we plan to have our failover network. The, the problem was the uh, dichotomy between security and, and accessibility, uh, which we have since changed. So at the time, um, we tried to fail over to our backup network. However, uh, the security protocols that were in place were looking for a campus IP address. But we didn't have a campus IP address because we had no access and we had no, no network. So we were unable to fail over to our uh, backup network. Uh, we uh, on Stony Brook have a cogeneration facility. And one of the important things that we did uh, was, was what's called an island procedure. Essentially, uh, we remove ourselves from the power grid. Normally we're connected and normally we generate power and actually sell it back to the local power grid. Uh, but we removed ourselves from the power grid for an important reason, because if the power grid loses power, which it did, and in many cases uh, there were places in the island that were without power for greater than 40 days. Uh, if it loses power while we're connected to it, then we get knocked off uh, with it, uh, if you will. But if we island ourselves, removing ourselves from that in advance, then we're essentially self-sufficient. We can keep our, our power, our lights on. And we did that. Luckily, we did that. But despite that, um, we had a, a piece of high-voltage switch gear go in the hospital uh, about three hours into the network outage, and uh, certainly when it was, was dark out at 10 o'clock at night. And we had 37 minutes on campus where, where it was complete darkness, inclusive of the hospital, uh, inclusive of all areas on campus, um, redundant uh, generators and uh, – uh, redundancies and, and failovers did not uh, necessarily work, and we had uh, some very significant communication difficulties, including but not limited to the countywide 800 megahertz radio system for all emergency services, which is located on the roof of the hospital and did not have a UPS at the time that was connected. So that was a, a major challenge in the dark and not even be able to talk to each other. And then uh, consequently, the, the regional uh, power and cellular outages uh, were affected because all of the cellular towers that were around uh, did not, in many cases still do not, uh, have emergency power and have redundant power to, to keep those up. So we had uh, no on-campus resources, no off-campus resources, no ability to get to the outside world, uh, cellular uh, problems, and even traditional UHF, VHF, and, and 800 megahertz radio challenges because of the power issues. At the same time, uh, because we did have uh, lights and power after the after the 37-minute interruption, uh, we became uh, a proverbial uh, beacon of light and beacon of hope for our colleagues. Uh, we began to get multiple requests for personnel, equipment, uh, and shelter. Now, the one thing I can say, uh, being an institute of higher education, we usually have uh, a lack of space uh, during the semester and during the school year, but there's plenty of open space 
when classes aren't in session. So folks traditionally like to come to, to campuses uh, you know, to open up shelters, in this case, community shelters. Um, so those, those requests started to come in. And we're you know, a state agency that's located in a town, in a county. So those requests were coming fast and furious for multiple emergency operation centers, some of which were uh, you know, plugged into where we were locally, some of which were located way upstate New York. Uh, so there was a, a bit of a, a challenge in communicating and seeing if those are duplicate requests and, and how that was. Our, our Southampton campus, uh, in the days that followed, about a week after when the storm kind of subsided and the, the storm surged, we opened up a shelter for the Department of Homeland Security for 250 out-of-state workers who were coming to do damage assessment and the like. Uh, we kept that open from the, a couple of days after the storm and uh, through and including uh, Christmas of 2012. So talk about a non-traditional uh, role there. And I think that second uh, bullet there is a duplicate of inadvertent duplicate, so I apologize, but what it probably should say is we also became the FEMA emergency fuel dispensing station for all of Suffolk County. And over the course of uh, two days, working around the clock, we dispensed more than 19,000 gallons of gas to uh, first responders, to long-term care facility workers, nurses, doctors, and the like, to get them back to work. Because we, what we had regionally was two things. We either had gas stations that had no gas in the ground, or we had gas stations that had plenty of gas but no power, and therefore couldn't get the gas out of the ground. And we reverted to uh, 1970s, 1980s era license plate alternating days where, where people can go and get uh, gas. So we coordinated through the hospital and through FEMA to, to become the Suffolk County dispensing station, and we essentially went into the gas station business for, uh, for two days, another non-traditional role. Uh, so I, I spoke about the power outage and, and the cogeneration facility. You know, what we had, we had to immediately contact RAVE because we have an obligation under, under the Gene Cleary Act and the Department of Education uh, to send timely warnings and emergency notifications. Uh, that doesn't necessarily stop because of, a, of a, an act of God or, you know, a storm or, or anything like that. So we were able to get on the phone very quickly with customer service and to keep those uh, communication lines open, a, you know, a back door, if you will, uh, and Rave was phenomenal with that, not just because this is their webinar, because they're here, but because it's their tried and, and true vendor. Um, we had those very you know, difficult staffing requirements, like I said, getting people in, getting them to come in, roads blocked, trees down, a good portion of Long Island's infrastructure, electrical infrastructure is above ground. Uh, so there was many, many challenges with that. And as I mentioned, our partners in the surge capacity, the medical surge capacity, knew that the hospital and the veterans home had power and had beds and had room because we had done a rapid discharge. So in the middle of a hurricane, uh, some people that had not previously evacuated, particularly on those low-lying areas on the South Shore, started to send up ambulances and, and, uh, and patients to us for our care in the, in the midst of the storm. Uh, and like I said, Rave was phenomenal. We got on the phone. We, we also we used the, the key here to uh, emergency communication is having a multimodal system. So we're lucky enough to have a campus-wide voice-capable fire alarm system uh, for all of our academic buildings and at the time, uh, oh, I'm sorry, all of our uh, residential buildings and 90% of our academic buildings as well as in our hospital. So we were able to communicate with the masses that were here uh, right through police headquarters, right through our dispatch center which is another area that I oversee in an area that we, we do here on campus, all police, fire, and EMS uh, calls come directly into our department. So we were able to have that, uh, that non-traditional communication uh, while we were working to stand up other systems and scale down versions of the website and try to get you know, something up, at least for the intranet, while we were working to try to get the internet back up. So the takeaways here, uh, I mean, technology is phenomenal and technology is our friend. We use it every day. I'm a very, I would say, on the higher end of a tech savvy uh, a person in emergency management and in law enforcement. We have, as a result of this storm, gone from a, a conference room uh, to a, a conference room emergency operations center with a few laptops to a, a $1 million dedicated emergency operations center. We fought for the money and fought hard for the space. Uh, and happy and proud to uh, have come along the way the last five years. Um, know that you know your technology partners, whoever they are, uh, whether it's for you know uh, all of your emergency notification systems um, or whatever you, you rely on, whether it's the software, the hardware, uh, that you know how to get in touch with them, that you have a backup to get in touch with them, and you know 
everything that could possibly happen happened, including that's not in the presentation, but we had a gunpoint robbery in the middle of this hurricane uh, and a requirement to send out emergency notifications to that effect. And unfortunately, despite our efforts, we actually had some students venture off campus, uh, get into a car accident. We had one student killed and one student critically injured in the middle of managing all the other things that were going on. So you name it, uh, things we had plans for, things we didn't necessarily have planned for, uh, but they happened to us during the course of, uh, of the first two or three days of this. Uh, and we, um, again, despite best planning and best efforts, we were still doing a lot of things on the fly. And then last but uh, certainly not least is, um, is again, whoever your provider is, I could, I could vouch and speak for RAVE. Uh, they have always been since day one, whether it was onboarding the import process uh, and dealing with some of the challenges with our PeopleSoft system and uh, the early growing pains of migrating to a new system, up to and including, and to me it's more important, is when things are not going good uh, is when you can pick up the phone and call them. And we've always been able to do that, and I'm happy to continue to, to partner with them. And I think I will say uh, I'm pretty close to the 28, 29 minute mark. Uh, Don, I hope I, I kept things uh, close to schedule. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions or anything. No, that, that's great, uh, Chief. Thank you very much. Uh, there, there is a question. Uh, do you have someone in charge of emergencies at, at the hospital, and how are you communicating with that person? Uh, that's a great question. So. Um, I do have a counterpart. Uh, there's actually a an emergency manager, and, and they have two other. Their office right now is actually bigger than mine. We're going to go in some budget cuts, so personnel-wise, uh, administrative and civilian staff here. But um, so they're responsible for the hospital proper, really more of on the preparedness side. The response side is uh, is quarterback from from our area. Um, really, you know, we work with them on planning, but. A response is us. So we were in constant communication with them. They had uh, stood up a local emergency operations center, but the way we have it set up on campus is all uh, requests for information, for resources, and everything kind of flows through our main EOC, and then we communicate with them uh, in the hospital EOC because they're managing their own uh, individual issues, um, you know, medical gas issues, you know, uh, nursing shortage issues, spe uh, you know, specialty surgical issues. So that happens at the micro level and then macro level, we interface with them and we have representation. We have a police inspector that's assigned to the hospital who has representation in their EOC during any activations. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question before we, we wrap up. Uh, this refers, uh, you mentioned uh, opt-in versus uh, requiring people to um, just pulling their names into into the uh, system. Do you run into any resistance in that? Do you have unions involved? Um, how does that work out? So another, these are great questions uh, and all things we've, we've uh, faced with. So um, as I mentioned, you know, every uh, 52,000 or so emails are automatically uploaded. Uh, that's first name dot last name at stonybrook.edu. Uh, in addition to that, all, all unions and collective bargainings have agreed uh, in some cases, reluctantly so, but have agreed. We've come to the conclusion that if you're issued a Stony Brook University phone or Stony Brook Medicine phone, that's not your phone, it's the university's phone, so we're going to message to you. It's for your good, you know, for your own best interest, but that's our property, and we're going to send those messages. And then our students, we, we do it at parent orientation, uh, and it's an easy sell, really. Um, I, I'm, a big, I'm the guardian of the messaging, and we don't over-message at all. Uh, we reserve text and voice for those imminent safety threats, active shooter, shelter in place, hazmat, something that's happening right now. I don't let anybody, athletics, uh, public relations, um, uh, our food folks, anybody who wants access to our system gets uh, shut down pretty quickly because I know, I need people to know that when, when Larry Zachary sends a message, it's an important one, and if you're getting a text from him, they don't come very often, you need to listen to it. So the way to do that is to protect the, um, the integrity of your message and not allow it to be diluted by, you know, 20% off in the bookstore and this and that. I know a lot of my colleagues struggle with that because uh, multiple areas contribute to the funding of their emergency notification system. Uh, but it's uh, got that name for a reason. It's an emergency notification system, not to advertise the car wash or the, you know, the, the bake sale. Uh, Chief, thank you very much. We are uh, running a little bit over, and I want to respect the time of, of everyone involved. Um, if you have uh, questions or you'd like to continue the discussion, uh, 
Chief Zacharacy's um, contact information is here. I'm sure he'd be more than willing to uh, talk with you offline at, at, at your convenience. Um, and with that, uh, Chief, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Very, very informative webinar. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, and thanks to everyone for uh, jumping on. Happy to take any questions by my phone or, or by email at any time. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you again to everyone for joining us, and enjoy the day.